Why wait? PCB high temperature turbine vibration sensors. My name is Mike Scott from the Modal Shop, and with me is Dave Martin from PCB Piezotronics. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dave Martin. Uh, I'm going to start to talk a little bit about PCB. Um, I'm sure just about everybody on on the WebEx uh, is familiar with us, but just a few little highlights. You know, we were founded in the uh, late 1960s, 1967 to be exact, um, outside of we were actually in, started in a basement in, in Buffalo. Today, we're headquartered just outside of Buffalo in Depew, New York. Um, we're a very vertically integrated company um, from machining, um, making our own crystals, connectors to complete assembly of our sensors. All of our all of our sensors are made and, and cables are made either in our uh, Depew facility or another facility in North Carolina. We have a 50,000 square foot machine shop uh, across the parking lot from our main manufacturing facility in Depew, and we machine all of our components there. We are the a leader in industrial and energy sensors and applications, uh, really big in aerospace and defense, automotive, test and measurement, and so on. We're one of the uh, biggest providers of high temperature accelerometers and dynamic pressure sensors for major gas turbine OEMs. This picture is uh, about me. Again, my name's Dave Barton. Uh, I've been in the energy market for 25 plus years. A lot of industrial, a lot of energy, mostly energy. My current position is development manager with uh, PCB. I, I focus on energy and industrial applications in the Western United States and Latin America. I'm a category three vibration analyst. I've been with the API committee for a little over 20 years, API 670 specifically. Um, and a couple of little fun facts about myself. I was I was at the uh, 1989 Bay Bridge World Series between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's uh, when the San Francisco Loma Prieta earthquake happened. This is kind of a it's kind of a interesting predicament to be there. I mean, nobody at the stadium was hurt. Um, and everybody got out safely, so that was that was a good thing. Um, another another fact: I uh, when I was a young kid, um, my father took me to visit a power plant. He was a truck driver, and and he delivered to this power plant. And I was riding with him once and visited this power plant in Southern California on his deliveries. And the people at the plant took me on a tour. It's back in the days when there wasn't a lot of security and so on, so you could pretty much do what you wanted. Um, as far as getting people in and out of the plants, um, and it was an LM5000, uh, GE LM5000 aeroderivative plant, and I revisited there when I started my working career a few times and ultimately upgraded their vibration monitoring system uh, 28 years after my first visit there. So I've got a little history at that plant today. It still exists, still running in the same location. So the modal shop and uh, PCB Piezotronics are both part of MTS Systems Corporation, and specifically the modal shop is located in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I'm located. And we've uh, long been known in the test and measurement market for metrology, rental of instrumentation, field calibration, calibration services, etc. We're an A2LA accredited uh, vibration accelerometer calibration lab. Our primary tie to the industrial market is we manufacture the world's most popular portable vibration calibrator, which you kind of see on the screen there. And that's required for use uh, in any petrochemical application that is following the API 670 standard. That is about as professional as I can look. I tried my best. That's all I got. Uh, I've been doing this for 16 years. I worked at PCB in Buffalo for 10 years before moving down here and getting out of the snow and coming down to uh, Cincinnati. And I am the technical support person for the portable vibration calibrator. And uh, I am a fan of some of the world's most unsuccessful sports teams. Um, just growing up in Buffalo, I got saddled with that. But the thing I regret the most is... Um, you know, we got two baseball teams on TV in Buffalo. We got the Yankees and the Mets, and I chose wrong. I regret that.
quite a bit. I think I'd be way happier if I was. A, I'd have a few, a few championships. You know, there'd be some some time to celebrate. So as a company, we do understand uh, power generation. We have a variety of solutions for the market. We offer expertise in uh, ground fault monitoring on uh, generators, uh, especially brushless generators, uh, proximity probe troubleshooting, combustion dynamics, uh, noise exposure measurements, just to name a few. Uh, many of these topics, by the way, uh, will be covered in future webinars in this series. And, and that's right at the end of our presentation. We, we kind of talk about some of the future webinars. So please, uh, if you're interested, sign up for our other webinars. Uh, maybe you'll see how we do first and then <laughs> decide to sign up. But uh, one of the final slides here is the uh, webinar schedule. And, and next week, I'll be discussing troubleshooting proximity probes. So today, uh, we're going to be speaking specifically on certain gas turbine um, accelerometers. Um, first one being the General Electric GE uh, LM aeroderivative series. Um, and we'll talk a little on Siemens uh, V84 and 501 F and G gas turbines. Uh, and we'll move on to Mitsubishi 501 series gas turbines. And we'll kind of wrap up on Trent and FT4, FT8 uh, gas turbines. So, you know, why would you want to switch from what you're using today to a PCB high temp accelerometer or a high temp pressure sensor, let's just say. Uh, one, one thing that we're proud of and, and I'm proud of to be working for this company is, is that most of our sensors are in stock and ready to ship. And, and uh, I think that's, that's great for customers because sometimes you're in, a, in an outage, you don't, uh, you don't uh, know that you need the sensor until you get ready to take the uh, the machine down or you're in an outage and you need something urgently well we're we're there for you if you need us we can typically ship you a sensor almost immediately normally the same day uh depends on the time of day we get the order but typically we can get it out to you so that's that's not a problem um calibration we we'll talk about Mike's going to talk a little bit about calibration coming up in the in the next slides coming up. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about a little bit about our UHT12 products and eliminating spiking and the other benefits of our crystal that we use for the high temperature accelerometers and pressure sensors. Uh, final bullet point is cost savings. We will typically be a lot less expensive than any of our competitors on high temperature sensors and you're going to get a better product than you will from anybody else as you'll see as we get further into this presentation. So aside from that, uh, the audience, I don't think you folks need two certified category uh, two and three vibration analysts to talk about price and delivery. Uh, we hope you give us a chance to uh, to quote and show you um, what we can do for delivery, um, let us uh, propose our, our full value prop and uh, give you the pricing, of course, in, uh, in a guaranteed uh, quote with guaranteed delivery. Uh, but today we're going to focus on the technical advantages and we are going to start with calibration. Uh, so the very first topic today is uh, going to be full frequency sweep calibration that we offer on all of the transducers that you see here on the slide. Um, so let's just start with what that means, uh, the how and why of calibration. The first thing you do when uh, looking at a sensor is you calibrate the sensor at reference frequency. So in this case, with uh, this particular model, we're looking for a 10 picocoulomb per G output at 100 hertz, and that output needs to be within 5% of 10 picocoulombs per G. So any, anything from 9.5 to 10.5 picocoulombs per G is fine. Then to 2.8 kilohertz, that output needs to stay within plus or minus 5% of the sensitivity at reference, not the nominal value. So if we come up with 9.9 .9 picocoulombs per G at 100 hertz, then the, at the rest of the frequencies in the range of the transducer, the output needs to be within 5% of 9.9. .9. That is how uh, accelerometer, piezoelectric accelerometer calibration works per the ISO 16063 standard. And this is a globally adopted standard so that uh, accelerometer calibration is 
not the Wild West and everyone is playing fair. And it says at least six frequencies associated acceleration equally covering the frequency range are required in a piezoelectric accelerometer calibration, specifically single point calibrations, which is frequently offered on uh, turbine OEM high temperature vibration sensors are not recommended. So just to paint the picture, I thought I would take a different technology and, and try to relate the difference between a single point cal and a full sweep cal. So this is a linearity plot of an RTD. And you can see that the resistance is plotted throughout the entire temperature range. And this is what the ISO standard accomplishes in vibration. It requires that OEMs and calibration labs test the entire range of the transducer. This is what the same RTD linearity plot would look like if you only took one data point in the range. How do you know if this sensor is accurate at any temperature besides 400 degrees Celsius? You don't. Nobody would accept this as a calibration, and nobody would rely on this RTD, especially to measure critical temperatures. And yet, to be honest, the gas turbine market has historically accepted single point calibrations from their sensor OEMs. This is what a real frequency response sweep looks like for an accelerometer. So this follows the ISO 16063 part 21 standard. You can see the sensitivity at the top of the CalCERT and then the uh, confirmation of minimal deviations throughout the range of the sensor giving, which gives the user confidence um, that the, uh, the measurement is going to be correct. You can see we tested this sensor to 360,000 cycles per minute as the uh, which is 3000 Hertz as the high frequency limit of the transducer and each time our deviation was less than 5%. This is a single point calibration for an accelerometer. So this is what people normally get with their gas turbine OEM accelerometers or they might not even get the, the certificate and uh, it depends. Um, this is not allowed per the ISO standard. You can see the sensor is tested only at 100 hertz or 6,000 cycles per minute. Um, we do not know if the sensor is accurate at other frequencies. It could be called upon, for example, to measure gear mesh frequencies, and we have no idea if the sensor is accurate in the, in the high frequency range where gear mesh would occur. Um, as mentioned, most turbine OEMs use the sensors that are only calibrated at 120 hertz. So you get one data point and they do not follow the ISO standard. This instrumentation is relied upon to measure vibration on gas turbines, the highest criticality piece of equipment uh, in the plant. So um, we think it's very important to do a full frequency sweep calibration on these transducers. Um, but you might be wondering right now uh, why piezoelectric accelerometers are not calibrated for linearity, um, like everything else, right? Pressure sensors and um, flow and temperature, they're all calibrated for linearity. Why is vibration different? Well, uh, vibration is different because it's a, a different type of technology. It's much stiffer than those other technologies. There's a high mechanical preload. And over the course of 50 years of using the technology, uh, piezoelectric accelerometers have exhibited uh, extremely good linearity. So um, basically, the best way uh, it's been determined the best way to discover a faulty accelerometer is not through a, a linearity test, but through a frequency response sweep. Like a, a sensor could be very linear at 100 hertz, uh, you know, 2, 3, 4, 5 Gs, but it might perform terribly at 1,000 hertz or 2,000 hertz, you know, if there's something wrong with the crystal inside or the uh, preload has loosened or, or one of numerous things could occur to the transducer over time. So um, for piezoelectric, um, and that's only for piezoelectric, not for moving coils. Some turbines have moving coil, but for piezoelectric, uh, frequency response is the way to go instead of linearity. So not only do turbine OEMs use accelerometers that are only single point calibrated, uh, but the vendor for these accelerometers claims that no subsequent calibration is necessary. And this really kind of bothers me. It's hard for me to talk about this slide as someone who um, works in an accelerometer calibration lab. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this for 16 years, and I've never seen this statement before on any other vibration sensor sold in any other market. 
Um, it goes against uh, the ISO 17025 standard as well, for what it's worth. And I don't want to hit you with too many standards, but basically it's a calibration standard. 17025 is a calibration standard that says you should not make a calibration interval recommendation because as a lab, you don't know the risk associated with failure. So, you know, we're an accredited calibration lab. We do not make a recommendation on calibration interval unless the customer specifically requests it and we agree to it. So it's a kind of a two prong system there. Otherwise you just leave the interval uh, blank on uh, piezoelectric accelerometers and the um, responsibility really falls on the end user to make sure that they study the criticality of that transducer and the risk associated with uh, with failure. So gas turbine sensors are exposed to one of the most challenging environments in vibration monitoring and we we feel they should be calibrated uh, routinely because of that. Um, so um, we decided to put one of the OEM accelerometers to the test and actually do a full frequency response sweep on a transducer that was only calibrated by the OEM at 120 hertz. And you see at 120 hertz it passed. We were looking for 50 picocoulombs per G on this particular transducer, and we got 50.39, so it was very good. And the frequency response was also good um, from 30 hertz to 3000 hertz, but the sensor was specified from 5 hertz to 3000 hertz and at 5 and 10 hertz, we had deviations of 11 and 17 percent, respectively. That's where you see the um, highlighted part of the slide there is where it, it would have uh, failed calibration um, if the, uh, the OEM had put it through a real frequency response sweep. Now, this sensor uh, was old. Uh, it's from, I want to say, 2009. So it's, it's a little more than, it's more than 10 years old. So, I mean, you got to remember that, but also it was not subjected to the environmental conditions that a gas turbine accelerometer gets subjected to. So I, I would disagree with the statement here that says no subsequent calibration is necessary. Clearly, this transducer um, does need calibration. Mike, Here's Mike, some of the do you reasons. Feel that that, Mike, I was just going to ask, do you feel that that sensor sitting around lost any of its... Uh calibration, so to speak, or do you think it's just, uh, I'm sorry, I should have said the question for the end, but do you think that sitting around caused it to be in this condition or? Well, I'm not sure what, um, what really caused it. You know, it, I do think so. There's really only one thing that, uh, that would have caused it because it wasn't exhibited. It, it hit with, uh, ESD, it didn't get hit with high temperatures, it wasn't slammed around, it was kind of just sitting around on a shelf in a box for quite a long time. So I suppose this could have happened because the crystal is artificially polarized and then you get a depolarization of the crystal over time. Uh, what we found over time is uh, with ceramic transducers especially, they tend to lose sensitivity. Unless something's broken and you're getting, uh, you're not going to get amplified outputs. You're going to get reduced output over time. These are some of the ways that transducers break and a broken sensor on the right. And of course, um, gas turbine accelerometers have to deal with uh, uh, the environmental concerns as well. Um, they might be taken off during an outage. They might get slammed around a bit, thrown around. Um, or they might not, uh, but they do deal with high temperatures, um, challenging uh, electromagnetic fields, and, and stuff like that. Um, also, uh, gas turbine accelerometers are charge modes, so they don't have a bias voltage. The bias voltage on an integrated circuit piezoelectric accelerometer is kind of nice because it's like a red light, green light uh, as to whether the sensor is working or not. When charge accelerometers fail, they just completely die, uh, or they start to lose sensitivity, like in the previous example. But if they completely die, they just fail to produce an output. Um, but there's no bias voltage that tells you that. There's no uh, indication that says, hey, our sensor's dead. Um, usually you can catch it because you'll have an unusually low vibration level. Um, but if you have noise or if you normally run really smooth, um, a dead transducer could be missed. How often should I recalibrate my sensors? Well, we just did a webinar on this topic last week. You're, you're uh, 
let us know if you'd like a copy or that's also on YouTube. Um, the truth is nobody can answer this question but you. Vendors can give advice, but it comes down to the likelihood of failure and the severity of that uh, failure. If a turbine goes down, it's always in the major severity category. I've never had a customer that where it wasn't. Um, however, you could you could argue that it's certainly in the remote or occasional likelihood uh, category with the the left hand side of the graph there. Probably more in the remote category. So you have to take that into consideration. How likely is it to fail and severity? Uh, if the um, accelerometer on the gas turbine fails. And I'm not here, we're not here to say that OEM gas turbine sensors are bad. Um, they're made by high quality manufacturers. Um, in fact, our own company, PCB Piezotronics, as Dave mentioned, makes uh, some gas turbine accelerometers for other turbine models that we're not going to be discussing today uh, for the OEMs. But um, we do have technical advantages in our designs. One of the biggest is the fact that we can test the accuracy of the transducer throughout its range. And um, that's why we feel that a full frequency sweep calibration is uh, really important for a, a transducer. That's going to go on one of the most critical, the most critical piece of equipment in your plant. And I would ask the contrarian question, why not recalibrate? Um, you know, there's a couple reasons on the slide there, but um, since these sensors go on a piece of equipment that's so critical, why not make sure that they're accurate and operating correctly throughout their frequency range? Um, and uh, in regards to some of these reasons why not, at the very end of this presentation, I got a couple slides on a device that will allow you to test these sensors in-house simply and easily and quickly. So we'll show you that device in a second. And we're going to, that's enough out of me yammering about calibration and my strong feelings about it. So I'll turn it over about our uh, UHT-12 sensing element advantages. So, uh, yeah, my can you change the slide? So we like to talk about why, um, why switch to ours. UHT-12 sensors, um, and there's there's several reasons. Um, they're, they're, they're very good reasons, um, you know, based on my past and, you know, what I know about the uh, gas turbine sensors and how they're constructed. Um, and one of the big things in, in my mind as to, as to an advantage over some of our competitors is that our, our crystals are synthetically, synthetically grown. Um, and there was a there was a, a company in the past that uh, that made uh, make sensors that still exist today, and they relied on on uh, mined crystal that they had to they had to get, and they needed a certain quality of this crystal in order to make their sensors accurate. Uh, so they at one point they they ran into a shortage. It was a, probably about a year and a half where they were short on this specific quality of crystal. To be able to make their sensors, and it caused it caused a big problem for them. Ultimately, they found it. Uh, they had had or have a stock still of it that'll last them a long time. But but that's that's a big a big advantage to me um, on UHT12. Uh, next, we're we're stable and reliable up to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is maybe 700 degrees Celsius. If anybody's on the Celsius scale out there listening. So, you know, we have no signal, signal de degradation up to that temperature. So everything's going to be clean and, and no, no interference all the way up to those temperatures. And even, even beyond that temperature slightly, you're still not going to have any signal de degradation. But our highest temperature UHT-12 sensor is only maxed out at 1,200 degrees per engineering. But we have a... We have a we we can go a little higher than that as necessary. Um, so you know the, the signal spiking on the, on our UHT-12 sensors are, is greatly reduced because of thermal changes um, within it, allowing for uh, a cleaner, consistent signal. Um, a lot of sensors that I've worked with in the past and in, in my career also uh, a, as the signal 
begins to, the temperature begins, begins to change, the signal beca uh, gets a spurious spikes in it. Um, it's related to the, the decay rate of the uh, signal conditioner time constant. So with, uh, with ours, we don't get that. Um, high insulation resistance on our UHT-12 sensors. Um, so we get uh, a low noise operation throughout the range of our sensors due to, due to the high IR. Um, our sensors from, from tests show that we've got a greater than 10 times uh, insulation resistance of other, other high temperature sensors out there in the world. Yeah, another, another very key part of our sensors is they're all designed in, in shear mode. Uh, the element, element design is shear mode, which has a lot of advantages. Um, you know, and one to me, Vig, is, is, is mounting, mounting of the sensor. Uh, you're not, you're not going to strain the base of it when you mount the, mount the bolts or bolt, however many holds the sensor down, uh, is not going to affect the, the signal coming out of it. Um, compression design, you always, you know, got to torque all the bolts down exactly the same. Uh, you know, if they're four, you got to go across each other or some of the manufacturers will tell you if you don't torque them down right, you can damage the crystal. Well, you can't do that with our sensors. Um, yeah, our, our, uh, our element is, is preloaded at 90 degrees, which makes it shear mode, of course. So. That avoids a lot of these these stresses, and and speaking of shear mode again, nobody uh, makes a shear mode design high temperature sensor. They're all other than PCB. Everybody else is uh, compression mode. So these are uh, some of the sensors uh, that we do. We have many many others, uh, mainly for gas turbines. You know these, these models. Um, 357s there on the top are used more for uh, research and development with gas turbine OEMs. Um, they're not not typically installed permanently on gas turbines because they're not industrialized sensors. Um, they're not an industrial package. Um, the ones in the bottom are just a couple examples. The two on the left are gas turbine accelerometers um, that can be mounted permanently on a gas turbine. And then I threw in a, a uh, dynamic pressure sensor in there, there as well, because uh, we make a whole line of dynamic pressure sensors for every major OEM uh, for uh, the combustion, by, combustion dynamics monitoring. Uh, okay, intrinsic safety approval. Mike, you want to take that? Sorry. Yeah, in this last section of the presentation, we'll we'll take a look at the four transducers you see on the right of the screen and just go one by one and compare them with the OEM offering. And the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the GE gas turbine accelerometer that does come with um, hazardous area approval. Uh, it has a CSA, ATEX, and IEC EX approval. And CSA is in North America for the most part, ATEX is Europe and IECEX for uh, the rest of the world. This is a close-up picture of our GE turbine accelerometer, which is a EX619 series. And as I, I mentioned, um, the OEM transducers on the GE gas turbines are not hazardous area approved. Um, this one is approved intrinsically safe, class one, zone zero. So that's a uh, hazardous condition always present. That's the strictest uh, class or zone. Um, we have all the cable and connector options available. And of course the sensors currently in stock and the footprint is the same as the um, uh, GE uh, OEM uh, turbine accelerometer. So there's no need to uh, re-drill holes or change the bolt pattern or change the threads or anything like that. It's a, it's a drop-in replacement if you will, and if, like I mentioned, we do have the cable and connector options so that you can use your existing cabling or existing charge amplifier if you want, or signal conditioning. Um, we have a gas group uh, 2B approval. And uh, I just wanted to point out though, um, this is the, out of the four, there's only one of them that gets a full frequency response sweep, one OEM accelerometer, I should say. And this is the one. So 
the GE accelerometers that come on your gas turbines do get a frequency response sweep from uh, 20 hertz to 350 hertz. So I, I didn't want to sell the OEM transducer short in that case. The next three are all single point calibrations. Starting with this one, uh, these go on Siemens gas turbines, uh, our model number EX615A42. Again, same footprint, sensors are in stock and they get a full frequency sweep calibration and of course hazardous area approval, class one div one. I don't have that on the slide actually, but class one div one. Oh, I wrote continuous hazard. That's what I, I, uh, I didn't write div one or zone zero specifically, but I wrote continuous hazard, um, which is the strictest area. You see a lot of the specs are the same, same sensitivity, same frequency response, um, same housing, hermetically sealed, same cabling, three wire integral armored cabling, same footprint, same bolts. Um, main difference here with the PCB model is the full frequency response sweep calibration. So we're certifying the accuracy of this transducer from 10 hertz to 5 kilohertz, where the OEM transducer is only calibrated at one frequency. This model also is for Siemens gas turbines, um, and it is the identical footprint and mounting um, as, as the OEM version. It receives a full frequency response sweep calibration. Of course, it's in stock. And this is a UHD-12 design, so um, the sensing element is far superior to the OEM design. And a side-by-side, spec-for-spec, again, a lot of uh, similarities, same sensitivity, accuracy, frequency response, housing, uh, cable, cable termination, temperature range. I'm just reading the slide right now. It's kind of boring. Um, but a uh, big difference here is the full frequency response sweep. Dave, did I forget anything about which Siemens gas turbines these go on in particular? The, uh, the 611 A20 is, is uh, typically the gas turbines that Siemens makes in Germany, uh, okay. where the other one is the ones made in uh, Orlando. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And the last uh, sensor that we wanted to talk about is for Mitsubishi and Rolls-Royce gas turbines, EX357 C71, a uh, little different, triangular design, same connector, 716-27, uh, two-pin mill. Uh, you see that a lot in aerospace as well. Um, same with the um, triangular bolt design. Superior frequency response on our model, full frequency sweep. Of course, it's stock, as we've mentioned. EX hazardous area, ATEX hazardous area approval on this one. Uh, same sensitivity, um, same accuracy. Uh, a lot of the stuff's the same. I keep just reading the slide, I'm sorry. But um, um, what I wanna point out here, again, full frequency response sweep calibration and a little bit better on the high frequency response here because ours is a lighter design. So that will um, increase the resonant frequency of the transducer. And in general, um, transducers can be used to one fifth of their resonant frequency. So if you can make a lighter design, you can have a, a design with a higher resonant frequency and you can offer superior high frequency response with that, uh, with that design. <clears throat> uh, dynamic pressure sensors, uh, you know, we are most of the presentations about vibration sensors, but we wanted to throw a slide in about dynamic pressure sensors. Uh, as well, since we have a lot of gas turbine people on the uh, WebEx, um, which are used uh, used to tune uh, gas turbines. Uh, we make all different kinds of dynamic pressure sensors, uh, remote, which is typically mounted away from the gas turbine. That's, that's to avoid the temperature back, you know, many years ago, they, that's the way they mounted uh, uh, dynamic pressure sensors to monitor combustion dynamics before high temperature designs were available. And as time moved on, they got to a close coupled uh, type of sensor that's actually pretty close to the combustor, but still far enough away to avoid heat. It was more accurate than remote. Um, and then, but some manufacturers, OEMs wanted a real accurate uh, dynamic pressure sensor for monitoring combustion dynamics. So 
companies started developing the on turbine um, dynamic pressure sensor, which is our 176 series, kind of the picture on the bottom is just an example. And we have just about every uh, dynamic pressure for every OEM. Uh, we do make some directly for some OEMs. Uh, and also we make uh, replacements, drop in replacements for others uh, as well. So I, uh, Dave made a deal with me and in exchange for me helping a little bit with the presentation and doing some of the grunt work, he let me throw this slide in there. So this is the <laughs> portable vibration, <laughs> portable vibration shaker table, portable vibration calibrator that uh, I'm the technical support person for, so uh, we take a lot of pride in uh, in this device that's uh, required by, uh, again, by uh, API 670 standard. Um, it's offered by both uh, PCB and the modal shop, regardless of, of who you buy or rent it through. Um, I am, I'm the primary technical support person. Um, uh, the modal shop also rents the device, and this is a great way to loop check your equipment, uh, sensor, cable, charge amp, ch cable out of the charge amp, data acquisition alarms. I mean, I've stood there when a customer gets a text message to their phone because they drove a, a sensor to the alarm state. So you can really test the entire system mechanically before you uh, restart your gas turbine or restart any other critical piece of equipment like a compressor or something of that nature. It's uh, quick and easy to use and um, you can also test uh, proximity probes with it. So I threw in a couple of proximity probe mounting pictures we, uh, we have a standard kit for the um, most popular is Bentley Nevada, but the uh, five millimeter and eight millimeter, 11 millimeter series, 16 millimeter series, we cover them all. And we also have the smaller pictures of mounting bracket for uh, reverse mounted proximity probes that are in the, the end of a long uh, probe holder, or uh, have some customers that call them a stinger. So if you have a probe in the end of a stinger, uh, you can test it dynamically with the shaker table and actually uh, simulate the vibration in mills. I mean, really mechanically simulate it in mills with the 4140 steel target, uh, 42 CRMO4 chemical composition, and um, uh, drive that uh, proximity probe to the alarm state. Let's uh, take a look at some guys that are actually doing that. This is courtesy of our sales channel in Indonesia, which uh, I've been to, been to this facility, Indonesia Power. Um, Step one, uh, top left there, uh, mount the proximity probe. Step two, set up the uh, the gap voltage. That's what they're doing in the second picture. And I think they're actually writing down the values for a static proximity probe curve, which was part of their procedure. Um, but the fun part is step three, uh, drive the uh, proximity probe at whatever the uh, first vibration alarm is. So you see the technicians calling the control room to uh, find out. Uh, what value they're getting. And in uh, the fifth picture there, they're getting 163, uh, they were doing it in microns, uh, it's Indonesia power. Um, so the, uh, I think the, uh, yeah, the alert was at 160 microns, uh, they were getting 163. So they were reading a little high, but nonetheless, the uh, alert tripped. And then they went to the alarm state of 250 microns. They're actually reading 277, but they were able to confirm, confirm that the, uh, alarm tripped as well uh, with that second set of lights there. Uh, I think that was a Shinkawa system if I remember correctly. Uh, so that's the portable vibration shaker table. That's what it can do. Um, future webinars, we've got uh, uh, November 5th, that's today. So I shouldn't tell you about that one. You're already at it. November 12th, next Thursday, 11 a.m. Uh, bright and early for me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll be uh, doing um, uh, proximity probe troubleshooting. It's really the biggest part of that uh, presentation. Uh, everybody likes that uh, topic. It's always the most popular topic when I do a training at um, uh, wherever I'm going. Uh, I, I shouldn't say any customer names. So just go with refineries and uh, power generation plants. They always want to know how to test prox probes. And they always want to know what happens if you uh, connect, set up the prox probe incorrectly. So I, I go over that and we'll go over that in the webinar next week and then we'll have a webinar on uh, noise exposure and noise dosimetry november 19th uh, on december 3rd uh, we'll have um, uh, a webinar about uh, detecting ground faults in brushless generators 
or brushed, could be brushed, but usually brushless generators. Um, and ground faults cause the current you know, to go everywhere and destroy the equipment uh, for lack of a superior technical way to say that. Um, so ground fault monitoring and monitoring the resistance of uh, generators on December 3rd, 24-7 uh, monitoring, uh, even while it's rotating. A little sales pitch there. December 10th, human vibration. Um, that's that's uh, like white finger disease, like exposure to, to human vibration uh, measurements and how to monitor for that. And finally, uh, a pressure sensor calibration for those combustion dynamics transducers that are on the gas turbines and uh, measuring the pressure in the combustion chamber. Uh, we'll talk about how to calibrate those transducers on December 17th. So it doesn't look like I can take a lot of Thursdays off uh, except for Thanksgiving. So you know I'm going to have fun on Thanksgiving. Uh, it's three football games, so that'll be good. That is the end of the presentation. Uh, again, my name was Mike Scott, and uh, I was joined by Dave Martin. You see our emails there. We hope you give us a chance to quote on these turbine high temperature turbine accelerometers and uh, let us show you what, what we can do. Yeah, if you have any need, you have any part numbers that you have for your OEM uh, sensors, send them over our way and we will uh, figure out what the replacement is. Thank you, everybody.